Welcome back to the Get Loved Up podcast, your number one resource for inspiration and motivation to live your purpose, make healthy living a priority, and thrive doing what you love. I'm your host, Koya Webb, a small town girl who chased her dreams and caught them, a former track and field athlete who healed using spirituality and yoga, and an entrepreneur who didn't let sexual assault racism and insecurities dim her light. And now it's your turn to allow these episodes with some of the top voices in spirituality, wellness, and entrepreneurship to inspire you to thrive. Let's get loved up together. Leah Thomas is a celebrated environmentalist based in Los Angeles, California, coining the term eco-communicator to describe her style of environmental activism. Leah uses her passion for writing and creativity to explore and advocate for the critical yet often overlooked relationship between social justice and environmentalism. With this intersection in mind, Leah founded and launched Intersectional Environmentalist in 2020, a resource hub and platform that aims to advocate for environmental justice, provide educational resources surrounding intersectional environmentalism, and promote inclusivity and accessibility within environmental education and movement. Leah, who is also a founder of the eco lifestyle blog, Green Girl Leah, uses her multiple years of eco-focused educational work and experience to inform her ever-expanding list of projects. As well as her audience of more than 350K followers, the graduate of Chapman University with a BS in environmental science and policy and a cluster of comparative world religions, Leah has interned twice with the National Park Service and has worked in leading green companies, including eco-friendly soap company, Ecos, and most recently, Patagonia. A fundamental optimist and opportunity maker, Leah used her time after being furloughed during the pandemic to create intersexual environmentalists. Leah's writing has appeared in a variety of publications, including Vogue, Elle, Marie Claire, and High Variety. And she is featured in Harper's Bazaar, W Magazine, Domino, Goop, and numerous podcasts. Leah, thanks for being on the Get Loved Up podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I am so stoked. Uh, I am so stoked too. I've been so excited just at your growth and expansion. I'm not on social media as much because I'm like so focused on my work. And then when I got on and I saw your book and I just went on a whole like kind of like journey through your your growth and evolution over the past two years, I'm like, Wow, wow, wow. How absolutely incredible. And I'm glad we get to catch up via podcast. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you are as amazing as ever. I don't know the first time. I don't know. I found you on social media a long time ago, went to a class that you taught a long time ago in LA, and you're just as amazing. So yeah, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Well, I feel I feel it's always special when you meet someone and you have an instant connection with them and then maybe you don't see them for a while and then you meet again and you're like, whoa, this person has done so much work. And I just have to just say, you know, even as people start to get into your book to, to just hear your journey of how you started out and you had one intention and then you had to kind of come come clear about like who you were and what you stand for. So I kind of want to take people through that journey, if you don't mind, just um, first of all, starting with like how you got interested in environmentalism in the first place, and then taking us through your journey of up until this day of writing this incredible, incredible book. Thank you. Um, So I'm from the Midwest. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, um, a suburb called Florissant. And I've always really loved plants and animals. I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, But it wasn't until college that I started considering environmental science. But I've always been kind of a science nerd. I didn't know if it was going to be biology or what it was. Um, So yeah, I decided in college to switch my major to environmental science and policy. And at this same time that I switched my majors around 2014-2015, kind of the Black Lives Matter movement and hashtag at the time on Twitter was starting to grow. There were more conversations about um, excessive force and criminal justice reform 
At the same time, there's also a March for Science and the Women's March, et cetera. So when I began my studies in environmental science, there were so many cultural and social shifts that were taking place for years and years and years. So I think that always informed my environmental practice to a certain extent, always thinking about how the environment was for Black and brown folks in the United States, because really early on, I started seeing in my studies that environmental legislation is not enforced equally for all people, especially along racial and economic lines. So that's something that always stuck with me for a really long time, just not understanding why there wasn't more representation of all the incredible Black folks and our contributions to sustainability because they are vast. Um, And then also just really wanting to advocate for both racial justice and environmental justice at the same time because communities of color are impacted more by environmental injustices, which I'm sure we'll get into. And over years and years and years, I just decided, you know, I don't want to be silent anymore. This is something that I need to try to talk about um, because we can't separate the liberation of people from environmentalism. And if we do, I don't really want to take part in that type of environmentalism. So it was a long ways coming. I skipped over a couple of things like dabbling as a National Park Service ranger, working at <laughs> <laughs> corporate sustainability at Patagonia for a couple of years. Um, and then I decided to just do my own thing, write a book, start a nonprofit. Nice. I love that. And so glad you did because those other things are fun. And when you said parking range, I laugh because it's like, I was just talking to the friend. She was like, you know what? My, my uh, friend, she just wants to be a park ranger because you get to be on the land. And, and so I just laugh because it's such a humble but powerful position and it seems like a lot of fun especially for a country girl like me so yeah, it's fun. <laughs> awesome well and what I love I think um the most is because I felt like you were my voice when I started reading the book I was like oh my gosh I felt like I can breathe deeper and I feel like you really and I think the first thing we should do is just break down what intersectional means because I know a lot of people aren't don't know and you did a lot of breaking down in the book and I think it's so useful because there's a lot of movements going around and people really aren't clear on like okay what is this really what does this really mean so can you break down um, what it means to be intersectional and specifically what it means to be an intersectional environmentalist absolutely and I'm glad you asked that question because Yeah, it is a really long word and not everyone understands what it means. I didn't know what it meant until, you know, a couple of years ago. And I really had an aha moment when I found it. Um, So intersectional theory was created in 1989 by um, Kimberly Crenshaw, who's an incredible black woman who's like a civil rights scholar, legal scholar, amazing boss woman. Um, But basically she was analyzing a lot of court cases and there was one in particular where there was a General Motors and I feel like this example is kind of helpful and we'll we'll get to it. Um, So there's a General Motors and they fired all of the black women at the office and the black women got together and they tried to sue because it was a clear instance of discrimination against black women. However, um, the court, they decided to dismiss the case because their ruling was, well, technically there's still black men who were working at the office. So this isn't a racial discrimination lawsuit. And technically there's white women who are working at the office. So this isn't a gender-based discrimination. And the argument for intersectional theory at that time wasn't that we have to create these super specific um, protected class is but there'll be so many loopholes in the legal system if you don't consider compounding factors because them being black and women at the same time compounded and led to that negative outcome. So an intersectional approach to um, feminism, for example, would be considering those overlapping factors, like how someone's race um, is also maybe a part of how they experience the world as a woman. 
And you can go on and on, and that's grown with intersectional theory to consider things like religion and spirituality and income and race and, um, you know, sexual orientation, whatever it is. But really, in essence, it's considering compounding factors and specifically when we're talking about identity. Um, So it's been applied to feminism since Kimberly Crenshaw created it, um, you know, since the 90s. And I feel like I'm an intersectional feminist because my feminism automatically includes the advocacy of Black women or the way I even think about feminism. It's just so intertwined with lessons from my mom, my grandma, et cetera. So I can't really separate it, you know? Um, So I wanted something similar for environmentalism because when you don't consider race, well, race is the number one indicator of where toxic waste sites are placed in the United States. Um, Income is another compounding factor, but race is still higher regardless. If you don't consider those things, then you'll have a pretty ineffective approach to environmental policy if you're just saying, well, you know, everyone should have the Clean Air Act. Well, it's not being equally enforced in certain neighborhoods based on race, so we have to consider it. So that's why I think we need an intersectional approach to environmentalism, considering those compounding factors. So people of color and low income communities don't continue to bear the brunt of environmental injustices. Ashe, and so it is. <laughs> I mean, that is, I, I think when people hear it, it makes them easy. It makes it easier for them to understand when it's broken down. And it has to be said so many times, because like you said, we have functioned so long the opposite way. It's going to take us continuing to say it and explain it for people to really, aha, you would think it, it, it's taken so many people to get, you know, brutalized by the police for people like, wait a minute, I think that's wrong. So <laughs> um, I'm glad that you've written this book and you're like, hey, this is this is how we have to look at it. And another thing that I love that you break down is just how it affected you personally to go through <clears throat> the challenges of the pandemic compounded with the, the racial uh, climate, with everything. Can you talk a little bit about how this time really affected you and really at the end of the day made you even more powerful because you wrote this book, but I really want you to really share how it was for you going into these spaces as an environmentalist and feeling unheard and unseen and how you kind of navigated that space. It was heartbreaking to say the least. And I think it's a heartbreak that I had had for years that I just didn't know was heartbreak. And maybe I had pushed past certain microaggressions or just thought, you know, it it is the way that it is. But even looking back to certain classes I took and microaggressions and things like that. But I think it was a a long time coming. Um, And during 2020 specifically, when I saw so many of my environmental peers, people I had protested with for salmon and water conditions, being silent when it came to Black lives, I just, it was heartbreaking. Like, seriously, you will use my labor at your environmental organization or at a protest, but you're telling me that the liberation or just safety, like basic human rights and needs of my people isn't something that you want to consider in the context of your work. So I just realized like, I can't do that. And that is not safe for black folks. That is not safe for people of color to be in environmental organizations or spaces or movements where their lives isn't even a consideration because white folks' lives was a consideration. They're always talking about, we have to fight for the future and the climate crisis. But what they're saying is in that future, that's when it will affect them or their children or their future grandchildren. So I'm going to protest to protect a future for their white grandchildren, but they can't go to a protest or help protect my people right now in the present. So there's just a lot that wasn't adding up. Um, So during that summer, I knew that I had to say something um, because it just wasn't adding up. And I think a lot of people in the environmental space in particular were feeling very similarly. 
But it's not just the environmental space. I feel like intersectionality can be infused into so many spaces and systems and kind of has to be. But I think the summer of 2020, there's just too much going on, um, like you said. So I really had to take a step back and just think about what was important to me and the types of spaces I wanted to kind of exist in. Yeah, I think that's very powerful. I definitely uh, felt it in the vegan space. You know, here we are advocating for like animals and and the planet. And it's just like, but wait, I mean, we're advocating for people, but people in the moon would straight up say, yeah, I like animals better than I like people. Unapologetically. And I say, noted, seen, obviously. (laughs) So, you know what? At least you're truth telling, okay? But that doesn't make it okay. It's actually terrible. Um, that's my least favorite quote in the in the in the vegan movement, just so everyone is clear on that, <laughs> because it's painfully obvious and it's painfully true, and it's n- not okay. And so, <laughs> thank you for just speaking to that and how traumatizing it is to see something and re- to for me, just so people know, it to read something like that is it's traumatizing for me because of all that I advocate for, and then to see people respect people that are frightened hard and making movements say things like that and you don't feel safe in your skin is traumatizing. I think people need to hear it more to know how traumatizing these comments that are like, ha ha ha, just cliche and funny. It's not funny. It's not funny because my my children, my nieces, my nephews, my, my family are experiencing pain and suffering because of these things. Yeah. And I love that you talk about also in your book how just speaking up, you know, and you kind of give people things that they can do um, to really move the needle. So can you share some of those things? I know I went deep, but I just, it just really moved my soul. And I was like, yes, we need to talk about this and be loud about it. No, I completely agree. And um, I have a friend, his name is Isaiah. So I don't know if you know him, but his Instagram is queer brown vegan. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely love everything that he talks about. He talks about everything that you're saying. And he's also featured in the book. Um, That's one of the case studies because I think veganism and plant-based eating, like you said, there's a lot to deconstruct there, even though the black community in the United States is becoming vegan at higher rates. We're not always as reflected and, you know, we could go on and on about that for later. Um, But I think, yeah, a good place to start is just learning and not in a punishment way, just understanding that, oh my God, there's so many stories that have been left out of environmental history. Like how fun would it be to uncover them? Um, And I recently wrote an article, it's called, I think all my environmental heroes are black women. And I talked about this woman named Betty, who's a 100 year old park ranger and my friend Ray Wynn Grant, who's a black bear biologist and just finding those beautiful stories just so you can kind of um, widen your perspective about what environmentalism looks for different people. So that's a good way to start. And I think that's also positive. And then if you want to get involved with environmental injustice, um, it varies from community to community. Some communities have poor air quality. Some like Flint have poor water quality. Other ones, it's all about access to food and just the way that the city is set up and having more fast food restaurants and not a lot of organic produce or fresh foods, et cetera. So really just figuring out what's happening in your community. And the best way to do that, honestly, is Googling like climate justice organizations, insert city, because chances are there's a collective, there's a group they're trying to fight, but they need resources, amplification, and support, and you could be that person. So figure out what's going on and then have some fun doing some reading, some learning, some deep dives, and kind of changing your view of environmentalism um, because that's contagious. It'll spread. And once you start talking about, oh yeah, I'm a nature lover. I love sitting on my patio and going for a walk around my neighborhood. That can just show people, oh, I can go on a walk around Silver Lake um, and still be an environmentalist or a nature lover. I don't have to summit a mountain um, and just building that connection for yourself and also other people. I love that. And I feel like it takes us just mentioning those things because people are like, oh, I'm not an environmentalist. And that's because that's not my occupation. Then how can I 
contribute. And I, and I love how you just break it down so many ways that you can simply contribute by connecting with other people who are doing the work like yourself and, and writing the book and things like that. Can you share with us basically, um, and I love that article, by the way, I think, <laughs> I think that's the best thing that happened in social media um, during the pandemic is the exploring and amplification of Black voices and Black people and people of color and other people who have been marginalized. I think that was the best thing that happened um, out of the whole, whole situation because I feel like everyone, no matter who you were, realized the importance of that. Even though it slowed down a lot, I think there are a lot of us that are like, nope, it's still happening. We're still doing it. It's period. It's happening um, from now on. Um, can you share with us kind of some of your favorite books um, that I love, love, love reading. I read like a, a book a week. So what are some of the favorite books that um, you've read that really helped you in your education? Um, so there's one called All We Can Save. Um, it's a really good collection of essays, mostly from women of color. Um, so that's a great one. I also love this book. It's called Black Nature. I turn to it every now and again. There's over 100 poems written by Black Americans throughout history, over 100 years and 100 poems. Um, I love that one in particular because there's a lot of poetry from Black folks that people might classify as like civil rights poetry or social justice poetry. And the person that put the anthology together is like, what are you talking about? There's so many nature themes throughout Black literature and poetry that these should also be considered nature poems. You can't just classify every work as civil rights or, you know, whatever poetry it might be intersectional in nature. So it was nice to come to that and look at these different poems and the ways that Black folks throughout history were interacting with their environment. It just was really, really cool. So those are two of my favorites. I'm putting both of those on my list. <laughs> so excited. And what do you feel like kind of was the most impactful part of writing this book for you? It was very therapeutic. Um, yeah, I just, I even, I think about my time spent writing the book and it's all kind of a, it's a haze. I don't know. I was just so into it. I was writing it during the pandemic and I'm the type of person when I have something to say, I'll say it when I don't you know, I'll be quiet. Like I might be quiet for years, but I had something to say. I had it on my heart and there's something just so freeing about that. And then also I know that I can back it up. Um, there's that Beyonce <laughs> lyric from Ego where she's like, I walk like this because I can back it up. And like when I was writing the book. <laughs> we all love Beyonce. Everyone listens to the podcast. So yes, we love Beyonce represents. Because <laughs> I was like, I talk like this because I can back it up. I got the data. I got the people to support me. So what can you say? Like, this is true. This is here. And I'm going to speak my mind. So I think that was just, yeah, such a great feeling. Oh, I love that, including the Beyonce reference. <laughs> I think it's so important. And you do back a lot up in the book. Um, and I think also, like, I feel like um, there's a lot of things that people can watch. And there's a lot of, I, I want to say, there's a lot of questions that you give people. Um, can you kind of give us, like, the top I guess the top five questions one can really dive into when it comes into being a better person on the planet. And I like, I was on one of my podcasts, I think it was with Tomal Dodge. And he was like, you know, my goal is just to call, uh, cause the least amount of harm. I mean, like none of us are perfect. We're all doing the best that we can. So can you give us just kind of five questions you can really ask yourself that people can really um, take to ponder on how they're showing up and how they can be a part of causing less harm. Ooh, okay. One of them is a certain level of self-awareness, which we have to check all the time. Like, I don't think most people are going to transcend their ego. Some do, I don't know, but like <laughs> thinking about how you're how you're feeling, like just honestly being, am I sad today? Am I stressed today? Am I anxious because of this climate change news? Because I've seen a lot of people in movements at times make fun of other people, tear people down, etc., or just really harshly critique people for their separate theories of change and how they're going about creating change. And sometimes it might be because they're feeling 
scared because even when I'm anxious, I'm irritable, but I don't always know in that moment when I'm irritable, Oh, I'm irritable because I'm anxious. So I think if we could take more time to just be honest with ourselves, whether we're scared, we're feeling insecure, we're sad, we're grieving, whatever it is. Um, I remember I was grieving something like a relationship for months and I had no idea until someone was like, Oh, that's just grief you know, you're probably just grieving. And that was just such a wake up moment for me. And I think oftentimes during a pandemic, during a climate crisis, there's a lot of grief. So the number one thing is just tap into that self-awareness and get curious about yourself because, you know, you might be interacting with the world in ways that you don't even know until you check in with yourself. Um, Another one is just understanding your own privileges. I think we all have them and some ways, some more than others. Um, And just checking. I remember I didn't really think about disability that much, to be completely honest, as a currently able-bodied person. Um, But then I realized I was a park ranger and I didn't know that some of the parks are inaccessible for people in wheelchairs or with disabilities. And I want them to experience nature in the outdoors. So thinking about communities outside of your own, because it doesn't take away anything for the advocacy of your people to also be an advocate for other people. Some other things I would think, if you can, I mean, supporting conscious capitalism, shopping local, um, trying to reduce harm by getting things that are fair trade, uh, locally sourced, ethically made. But I know sometimes there's a really hefty price tag on that. So some ways to reduce harm in our consumer choices is honestly reusing, repairing, recycling as much as you can. Um, And some other things, I'm trying to think of one more thing to cause the least amount of harm would be to put joy in this world. We need a little bit more joy. And that (laughs) makes that a part of your activism, like the way that you're caring for yourself and your community can be joyful because we're all dealing with just so much. And even the work that I do, I try to make it 20% about the environmental injustice and the systems we want to dismantle and 80% about the incredible role models, um, the diverse people who are making solutions, their stories, their work, hope. I try to make 80% of my work about that. And I think people can do that as well. You can create less harm in the world when you spread joy because it's pretty, you know, radical. Yes, joy, joy, joy. That is so important because when you think about all the things and all the ways that we are being challenged right now, it's easy to not have joy. And so um, joy is liberating because it is a choice and it is something we don't have to choose because we have a lot to be sad about. We have a lot to be angry about. We, We have a lot to be frustrated about. So I love that you said making that choice to choose joy because we can choose that as well and still be frustrated and angry and, and, and we can experience an intersection of emotions, you know, speaking of intersectionality, um, let's talk about the fact that we can have, we can hold these dual emotions and, and still be um, okay and still be well. And I think that's important. And I feel like we are actually championing that more as well. Just understanding that we can have all these emotions and we can push forward and and thrive in this way. And I also love that you said just really knowing, I think kind of where, where you are in, in advocating for whatever you can when it comes to reusing and recycling and upcycling and things like that. I feel like a lot of people don't know how simple it can be. It can be like, cleaning out your closet and just giving everything to like your neighbors or uh, goodwill or something like that. Like, and I've, I've committed to once a week, like once a week, if you ever want it, give it away. <laughs> just give it to someone else. I'm going to do that. Yeah. That sounds good. I'm moving out like tomorrow. So that sounds good. Yes, it's so refreshing. When I moved, I uh, moved from LA to Atlanta. I gave away 50% of my stuff. And I still have a lot of stuff. So it's like, that's why I made that commitment. I was like, you know what? I'm never going to ever have this much stuff again. I don't know if I can live up with that, but I'm going to try because I really want to have less and experience life more. Um, And that is my goal as I, as I continue to spend time on this planet is experience more, have less. 
I like that. That's going to be my mantra for the week as I go through all my junk in my house and try to just walk away with like five t-shirts or something. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> oh my goodness. Five t-shirts. I feel embarrassed. I don't know. why. I couldn't even count how many t-shirts I have. So that is, that is a really bold goal, but I do have a friend that keeps everything in a backpack, one backpack. I don't know how to do it. So talk a little bit about your move. Like what made you move to LA? How long um, do you feel like it'll last? Yeah. So I was in Santa Barbara, I think since 2018, 2019-ish. And I was there for a job. You know, I worked at Patagonia and then I don't work there anymore. So I can be remote. So I think it's a time in my life where I'm 27, I'm single, you know, most of my friends are in LA. So I just want to have some fun and while I'm remote and have a lot of freedom. So I had never lived in LA. There's more people here, which is really nice. And I'm just, um, so Airbnb, they have those like monthly fully furnished rentals that you can sublease. So no furniture, no nothing. I'm going to be in LA for two months and then I'll probably be in New York for a month and I don't know, maybe Paris for a month. I don't know when I'm going to get to do this again. So that's, that's part of the reason. I love that. Congratulations on your nomad. (laughs) I think I had that for two years and it was so much fun. I mean, then eventually I wanted some grounding, but the nomad life is, is a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm going to try it until, you know, I get tired of it and then we'll see how it goes. Maybe when I don't know. Maybe when there's some love in my life. Well, I have all sorts of love, but who knows? Maybe I'll settle down one day. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. Speaking of that, like, what is your core? What really, when it comes to spirituality, do you have practices that you do that really help keep you grounded, especially dealing with so much, um, you know, complex emotions when it comes to intersectional work? Um. I would say that's something I'm definitely figuring out. I studied comparative world religions in school in addition to environmentalism. So I'm like really fascinated by religion, spirituality. My parents are Christian. My grandmother's Buddhist. Maybe I gravitated towards the Buddhism a little bit more, which is really cool. Um, But I feel like I'm finding my way. I mean, I love to... I haven't done yoga in a long time, but I used to go a lot. I just started Pilates, reformer Pilates, which is a lot of fun. Um, So I don't know. I think, I know it's not a spiritual practice, but it's a way that I say, well, just moving my body, getting some sunshine, connecting with earth, I think is the most spiritual practice that I have. I was just going to say that, like being in nature is one of my favorite, absolutely favorite spiritual practices is just going out connecting with nature and all around and is and being water specifically is very spiritual and cleansing so that sounds absolutely beautiful and we can hook you up with a get loved up membership so you can practice all the yoga you would like whenever you want you have some incredible teachers to practice with awesome Awesome. and so now that you have you're moving you're traveling i'm sure Pilates, but I'm sure it's a little bit harder to be well. A big um, pillar of Get Loved Up is well-being and wellness. Do you have your go-to practices? Um, Will they change up as you travel or how do you stay well during this time? Yeah, it can be difficult, especially movement. I do best when I have a regimen. It just makes me, you know, feel a lot happier, but moving around a lot, that kind of shifts in terms of if I want to take classes and whatnot. Um, but I do try to bring some equipment, even if it's just resistance bands. And then I also have gotten really into like a speed jump rope Mm -hmm. and jumping rope is, it's, it's really good. I feel like it's less intense than running and it's a really great workout and not even just the workout part as an anxious person, you just exert so much energy when you're jumping. So it really just calms me down. So honestly, that's about it. Um, also I'm noticing the power of nutrition. I think for a point in the pandemic, I definitely was sitting on my couch and just kind of eating whatever I wanted, which is fine too. I think we need to do that sometimes when we need to turn our minds off, but I've also noticed that eating well, it's not even just about fitness. It just makes me feel better. So, um, I try to actually buy like small batch 
things, which is really easy now that I'm on the go. So I have to eat it. So even if I'm going to Erewhon, because I feel like, you know, I'm not at a stage where I think I can make all my food because that just sounds exhausting. Being honest with myself and getting some like beets at Erewhon and their hot food bar or whatever it is. Um, so that's something I can do each day. Like, okay, I want to eat well, but I know that meal prep just sounds exhausting. Maybe that'll be next year. So this year I'll just go buy a couple of things at, you know, the farmer's market or a healthy place. Um, so yeah, that's now, but we'll see how it goes. I love how organic it is because I'm very structured, right? And I like people to hear like how easy it can be just to be organic with it and, and just like, yeah, I'm going to do this right now and maybe I'll eat some more now. Maybe I, but I feel like giving yourself permission to just have fun and giving yourself permission to just figure it out. I feel like we need that softness right now, especially with, you know, things being very uncertain. I love the way you're just like, yeah, I'm just going to let myself experience what being well and what eating well means to me right now. I think that's that's so beautiful. And I feel like it definitely is in flow with your personality. I'm just like, yeah, I'm just figuring it all out. I love it. Um, and when it comes to entrepreneurship, I know like, if, you know, of course you're working for Patagonia, but now as a 27 year old, you're in this lane of kind of building your own table. How does it feel and what are you most excited about? It's really cool. And I feel like the best thing about building your own table is just like all the people you can bring along with you. So that's what makes me really happy. Like with my nonprofit thinking about, okay, how can we have a four day work week? How can we build to a place where we have, you know, a small team that's paid well. And like, just thinking about all the things that I wanted when I was in corporate America in terms of benefits and things like that, it feels kind of like an experiment at times. Like it's just so fun to just reimagine the ways that businesses can flow. And there's a lot of learning lessons along the way, things that you're like, I thought this was a great idea this wasn't but that's just kind of a part of the process but yeah I really love it and I think mentorship is something that I also just crave like I had I've had so many incredible mentors so I love building an organization where maybe my younger self as one of the only like black students in my program could look to and say oh there's a climate justice collective that maybe I could be a part of and I just really want to create more opportunities like that um, but I think something else that I'm learning, uh, it's, you know, uh, I like working really hard. I don't like, maybe I don't like it. It's just kind of a survival mindset. It's something I've always done regardless, but I'm also learning the beauty of entrepreneurship at times of, oh, maybe I could actually slow down. Technically, I don't have to have any meetings on Tuesday and maybe I could use this time for myself. And that's something I feel guilty about. I'm sure a lot of people do at times, but I'm learning to embrace the Technically, I could go on hiatus if I wanted to. <laughs> be okay. Yeah. Yes. I think that's so incredible to admit because I thought I was doing good having the weekends off, only working from 10 to 5. And then someone, some creator's like, no, you're creative. You need to take days off during the week. Can you do that? I'm like, gosh, let's just keep getting challenged. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it is challenging. Like, when you, I love work, my work as well. So, it's challenging to say, oh, I'm going to take a work day off when people are available like hmm, that's gonna be hard but <laughs> I love I love your honesty um so what would you say I guess I wanted to talk a little bit I want you to share a little bit more about your nonprofit and your initiatives with your nonprofit <clears throat> Yeah, so it's called Intersectional Environmentalist. It started before the book. We call it IE for short. Um, and we're a collective of people all over the country and all over the world that are just trying to provide diverse climate and environmental education through documentaries that are student-led, our podcast, The Joy Report, and our social media channels. Um, we also do some consulting, which is a lot of fun, but the program that I've been working on for over eight months is called Earth Sessions that we just piloted. Um, they're essentially an experience at the intersection of art and environmental education, and we just piloted our first show in Brooklyn, and we hope to do them throughout the year, um, but we partner with two local nonprofits mususicians and poets. We put everybody in the same room to learn 
be joyful, listen to music, and then also connect with those other organizations and their community. So we're really just trying to imagine the ways that people interact with climate justice to make sure that it's also healing in the end. Um, so that's our new program. Stay tuned for more shows. Um, I think we're going to have them at least once a month and we'll be piloting some more throughout this throughout the summer. I love that. And how can people support? Um, the best way to support would be, you know, follow us on Instagram at Intersectional Environmentalist. Check out the book. We also have a magazine that's coming out. And then if you're able to, um, donating to our organization, we also have Patreon that you can check out. But any of those things are amazing. I love that. And what would you have to say if someone was just like, I want to be an environmentalist. I'm so inspired by Leah. Like, how can I get started? Ooh, I would say figure out all the ways that you already are first, like kind of think about, oh, do I reuse my plastic bags? Did, when was the last time I went thrift shopping? All those sorts of things. I feel like starting from abundance and what you already have versus starting from that scarcity or shame of, oh my God, I need to buy all this Tupperware and I'm doing everything wrong. Like, yeah, I bet you there are some things that you might be doing that are also really cool. And then just taking it one step at a time and thinking about, oh, how can I reuse something or get eco-friendly products? Or how can I support my local um, environmental nonprofit, et cetera? Um, but yeah, do a little audit, reward yourself for the things that you are doing, and then you know, compassionately guide yourself to do better in the areas that you're not. I love that. I feel like that compassion piece is so important um, when it comes to being a more mindful human, a more intentional, not feeling like you have to be perfect, but saying, yeah. let me just do something better. Um, speaking of that, if this could be Leah's world, we could wake up tomorrow in your world, what would it look like? It would be, I feel like everyone would have a farm or some sort of, <laughs> every backyard could be a farm. I think my friend Phil um, told me that he also is an IE co-founder, but yeah, I would love to see re revitalization of the land. So much of the soil is just not so great and soil can sequester and suck in carbon from the atmosphere. So yeah, I'd love to see more green spaces and there, whether in an urban environment, we need more rooftop gardens. I think everyone needs to have access to just be outside in nature, whatever it looks like to them. So in my perfect future, lots of farms, lots of gardens, and then hopefully, you know, just the basics like clean air and clean water. Let's start there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Clean air and clean water. Those two things. It seems like simple, but yeah. everyone could experience it. <laughs> it would be great. Mm -hmm. So great. Is there any um, last thoughts you want to share with the community? No, just thank you so much for having me on the show. This is great. Yeah. And where can everyone find you? Where can everyone buy a copy of your book, which I'm highly suggesting a book, but also the Audible because Leah is reading it and you have even um, intros and, and support people in there as well. So how can people have access to you and your book? Yeah, so I would say support your local indie bookseller. You can go on bookshop.org or IndieBound. Also, a Black-owned bookstore in LA is called Reparations Club, and they are selling the book, so buy from them. Um, and if you want to follow along with me, you can follow me on social media at Green Girl Leah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's just so much fun catching up with you. I cannot, hopefully, hopefully I get to see you when I'm in LA. Um, and yeah, just thank you so much for your time, your energy, the heart, the sweat, the tears you put into writing such an incredible book that's going to change the world in so many ways that we can't even imagine. But thank you for being a voice of change. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you all for listening. Until next time, love yourself, love others, and love the world one day at a time, one breath at a time. Peace and love. I just want to take a moment to say thank you for being part of the Get Loved Up community. I like to share topics and people making a positive impact in the world, and your feedback means the world to me. If you haven't already left a review, please leave a five-star review and let me know what you want to hear more of on the show. I'm here for you, and together, we're making the world a better place, one day at a time, one show at a time. Thank you for listening.